following the video that has the most views in this channel where we talked about how to read a WPS for beginners. This time we are going to talk about how a WPS can be written without any qualification tests. This is called a pre-qualified WPS. A quick recap of the WPS and PQR. WPS is a written procedure, more like a list of instructions on how to complete a weld, while a PQR is the record of the variables leading up to the completion of the weld and to the testing of its coupon. This proves the properties set in the WPS that are acceptable and within the specified code and not the skill of the welder. How is a pre-qualified WPS defined according to the code? AWS D1.1 Chapter 3, or Clause 3 as it is more commonly known, defines, as I have mentioned earlier, the exemption of a WPS from being qualified through testing. But note, even if it is pre-qualified, the WPS needs to be written because it is a guide to the welder of the procedure he has to implement during the process of welding the joint and its variables. With a pre-qualified WPS, you do not need testing, you do not need coupons, you do not need third-party laboratories which will cost you time and money. Though it will not break the bank, some small welding fabricator might still benefit from this pre-qualification. So, if there are no tests to be had, what are the caveats? Some parameters and variables need to be set to pre-qualify a WPS which are stated in the following applicable codes. The code that pre-qualifies this pro weld procedure is AWS Structural Code for Welding and here are some of the other codes as well. If you have, for example, structural steel, which is very common, use D11, aluminum D1, D12, rebars D14, and for stainless steel, use D16. You have to choose the right code for the right material, so you will not have any problems with the pre-qualification. Now, how do you go about doing this? Firstly, there are approved processes that can be pre-qualified. Not everything can be pre-qualified. According to Clause 3.2 of D1.1, these are the processes that can be pre-qualified. SMAW, SAW, GMAW except GMAW short-circuiting, I'll talk about that later, and FCAW. So does that mean that you cannot use GMAWS or short-circuiting GMAW? No. It just means that you need to qualify that procedure. But first, I'll talk about why short-circuiting GMAW is not pre-qualified. Since GMAW is a short-circuiting process suited for sheet metals, it only has a low current and low voltage input. That makes cold lapse or lack of fusion a concern, as you can see here. So again, this does not mean that GMAWS cannot be used. You just need to qualify them just like these other welding processes. ESW, EGW, GTAW, and of course, the short-circuiting GMAW. If you have to take a look into the code, it states here that these processes needs to be approved first through a qualification. According to Clause 4 of D standard. If you need to know more about qualification testing, you can watch this video later. There are also considerations with the base metal and filler metal used. As you can see here, in AWS D11, listed all the pre-qualified base metals that can be used with their tensile strengths and yield strength with their respective filler metals and their electrode classification. Note that the grouping of metals here is in accordance with their yield strength. If you take a look here, As you can see here in AWS D11, it is listed the pre-qualified base metals according to their yield strength and tensile strength with their respective filler metals and their electrode classification. Note that grouping of the metals here are in accordance with their yield strength. If you take a look here at 3.3, there are matching base metals which only means you have to weld steel to itself or steel to another in the same group. For example here, ASTM A36, if you weld onto itself, it will use a filler metal of E60 group or E70 group, depending on its tensile strength. How about this undermatching right here? It means steels with different strength from the same group 
or with different groups. Let me take you through an example. Say you will weld ASTM A36 to ASTM 570 grade 30. These metals are under matching, right? If you read the clause 3.2 in that table, you will have to use electrodes such as E6018 or E7018. How about for different strength groups? Let's say ASTM A36 will have to be welded to ASTM A570 from group 2 which are under matching as well. In this case, you have to use a low hydrogen electrode of the lower strength which is aligned with ASTM A36 as you can see in this one. You have to use low hydrogen electrodes as well like E6018 or E7018 depending upon the tensile strength of the base metal. There are other variables that needs addressing like electrode diameter, max current, among others as you can see here in table 3.7. Let's take a closer look. For example here, if you will weld with SMAW on a flat position, there is only a limit to the electrode diameter that you can use. Exceeding this limit will require you to qualify the WPS through testing. But what are the blanks right here? It just means that these are not applicable for the specific process. For example here, in SAW, welding at a vertical or overhead position is not applicable because it is not possible for submerged arc welding as it, as it is a form of machine welding. You can only weld in a flat or horizontal position. Minimum preheat and interpass temperatures are also defined in clause 3.2. Let me remind you why preheating is important. Preheating helps metal from cooling off quickly and it promotes a finer grain structure which also helps against embrittlement. As you can see in this table, the minimum preheat and interpass temperatures are a function of the thickness of the base metal at the point of welding. Anything lower than this specified minimum will require qualification, as lower temperatures may not suffice to produce the correct grain structure of the metal. These minimum temperatures are proven to deliver the right metal properties over the years. That's why they're pre-qualified. For the maximum interpass and preheat temperatures, you will have to note of the specific metals you are welding. For post-weld heat treatment, there are guidelines here in clause 3.14 which is pretty much self-explanatory. There is a limit in minimum yield strength, limits on how the base metal is manufactured. This is to assure that the metals are not too brittle and ensuring its ductility at the PWHT condition. And it shall follow clause 5.8 of AWS D11. There are also considerations for the joint design. For example here for complete joint penetration, which only means that the entirety of the joint is completely filled up, as you can see here. There are joint designs specified in AWS D11, for example, that pre-qualifies them according to the thickness, groove preparation, tolerances, even welding position, and shielding gas use. You just have to be aware of them, as you can see in the table. Consequently, for partial joint penetration, wherein the joint is not completely filled up, as shown, also has a pre-qualified configuration same with CJP. For PJP, there is also a minimum weld size depending upon the base metal thickness. Any deviation to this, as usual, will require qualification. Last thing to note here is that there are limits to pre-qualified variables. These variables, if changed, shall require new pre-qualified written WPS. That does not mean you have to do the qualification. You just need to write them down again. These are the amperage, or the wire feed speed, voltage, travel speed, and shielding gas flow rate. Finally, for FCAW and GMAW, as specified in clause 3.2, they will have to be performed using constant voltage and not constant current. That's it. That is what a pre-qualified WPS and how to write them. You just need to learn the variables that needs addressing. If you still have confusion regarding WPS and its qualification, click the videos right here.